I'm Ryan Mallory, and I'm here with Randy Sparacino. Randy, you're, you're running for office. Last time we were talking, you were running for the, the city of Medford uh, after a long career in policing for us. And what are you running for now? I'm running for Senate District 3, which is basically the majority of Southern Oregon, Rouge, Applegate, Jacksonville, Medford, Phoenix Talent. As a, a county, uh, Jackson County proper, most of it is in that. Any other counties? It's primarily all in Jackson County. After the realignment, redistricting, it's primarily all in Jackson County. Makes sense. All right. And uh, you're, who's been in that office before? So currently the uh, incumbent is Jeff Golden. Jeff Golden, okay. Right. And uh, prior to that, we had uh, Alan DeBoer and Alan Bates. Okay. What made you want to be a senator? Well, you know, uh, my experience as mayor is what really drove me to this decision. Uh, being mayor for the last, you know, since election in 2020, I, I started to see some things that were impacting Southern Oregon from Salem. How disconnected Salem is with Southern Oregon values and how the decisions being made are very Willamette Valley Portland-centric. And I thought, you know, we need to make a difference. And I found that, you know, as mayor, a lot of people don't realize I'm not the policymaker in in the city hall. Policymakers are the counselors. I'm just the uh, ceremonial head of the council and ceremonial head of the city, and I run the meetings. So you get to be the tiebreaker if there is one. There, I am the tiebreaker if there is a if there is one. There's only been one my entire time as, as mayor. <laughs> uh, but when you see that these things are impacting how we can govern in Southern Oregon, that they're taking away our local power. They're taking the power away from the people they represent. When they start to centralize decisions in Salem and not allow the boards and the commissions and the counselors in Southern Oregon to make the decisions for the people that they're representing, it's pulling the power away from these people that actually live here in Southern Oregon. So I started to notice this happen. Also, as you know, I used to be the chief of police. I retired as the chief of police. And I'm still connected with the Oregon Association of Chiefs of Police. And I've witnessed over the past several years how the legislators have been attacking law enforcement. Yeah, me not, too. Not directly, indirectly, and sometimes directly, but through legislation. And chipping away at the authority that law enforcement has had. And in a sense, it's reducing the safety of the citizens of so Southern Oregon. Reduces the integrity of law enforcement for all of us when that happens. Yeah, I definitely agree with you there. Um, and I think most people in what I would call uh, the southern part of Oregon and eastern Oregon, definitely, I mean, we feel underrepresented, but the system was designed to represent us. So it takes strong people to step up and head on into Salem to, to fight that battle. Uh, there, there's been other people before you in state offices that um, f felt like that was pretty hard, I guess is the best way for me to put it. Um, you're up to it. Yeah, I, I definitely am. I, I'm the kind of guy that wants to do the right thing, and I see that going to Salem and representing Southern Oregon is the right thing for us. We need a voice in Salem that actually is representing the values of Southern Oregon, and that's what I intend to do. Absolutely. I can appreciate that. Uh, what kind of things do you plan to approach first in your campaign? What kind of platforms are you running on? Well, right now I'm, I'm, I'm running on supporting public safety. I really believe that we need to address the changes that have occurred over the last several years and bring back public safety to the forefront. We need to ensure that all of the tools are available for law enforcement. And it's one thing to say you support a budget and, or you don't support a budget, but it's another thing to actually put it on paper and make a legislative decision that gives the tools to law enforcement to enforce the laws in the state of Oregon. I mean, Frankly, we have a lot of issues that are going on. Measure 110 was a significant issue, and we have legislators that aren't addressing the problems that it has created. It, granted, it created a lot of funding for potential uh, treatment programs, and I, I've read in the paper that those are coming, but it also has created a lot of issues with regard to overdoses. Our overdoses in Southern Oregon are almost triple what they were prior to 110. And we're not seeing a lot of utilization of the system that 110 has created. 
So those types of things could be legislatively fixed if we have folks in Salem that want to address that. And I definitely do. I still have many of friends in law enforcement and in the judiciary that are giving me information with regard to how this system has adversely impacted what was a good system in Southern Oregon. We had a very robust rock court and drug court that was really addressing the issues and getting people treatment through an incentivized program. The program they have right now is not incentivized. I had a judge tell me the, uh, back then that the uh, uh, drug court and rock court had a, a higher success rate than almost everything else, uh, and, and that people, people would go through the, the steps to stay out of custody and to try to get their lives together. And I mean, that's what I want for, for everybody. I mean, if somebody's stuck in addiction, I want, I want them out of it. And I don't think being lackluster in, in how we support law enforcement helps get them there. Exactly. You're 100% correct. The other thing that it's causing is it's bringing in a, uh, an element of folks from other states because they recognize they can come here and it's primarily legal to use a hardcore yeah. Also, also tends to bring in cartels and lots of other things that, um, you know, marijuana is legal here and it has been for quite a while. Um, that's different. When the cartels show up to grow, that money's being turned into other things, methamphetamine, heroin, and piles of cash. And they're not caring about the local public or anybody else while they're doing it. It's not your mom and pop, pop no, shop that's and, doing that. And they're breeding on local, uh, Landowners, they're they're taking advantage of them. I went on a ride with the uh, leader of our local illegal marijuana task force, and we drove around Southern Oregon. He pointed out every one of the illegal marijuana cartel hoop houses, and it was incredible. There's a hoop house. There's a hoop house. It, they're one after another, and we've made a lot of uh, inroads towards helping the problem, addressing the problem, but. More should be done. Legislatively, we need to do more to make sure that we cannot have these cartel grows in Southern Oregon. We have some water shortages now, too, that are deeper, deeply affected by that kind of agriculture, too. Yeah, it's a, that's a fact. And I know that some funding has been passed for Salem, and I, I think that, that there was some... Uh, we had some meetings with local politicians and uh, Congressman Benz at the uh, beginning of the year with some of members of law enforcement, and we, we brought up our concerns and the issues with regard to the illegal grows and what could the feds do to help us out. And I believe that uh, the congressman actually talked to some of his friends in Salem, which helped ignite and start the engine of getting those funds to Southern Oregon to help pay for the issues that we have down here. And, and you have some endor endorsements from law enforcement organizations and officials. Who, who are those? Uh, I have the endorsement, and it's, it's the... Uh, Nonprofit arms of the Sheriff's Association and the Chiefs of Police Association. I have their two endorsements. I have the endorsement of Sheriff Nate Sickler and retired Chief uh, Scott Clausen. That's excellent. Uh, what, you know, for me and a lot of my friends, business and how businesses are treated in the state of Oregon are, are a big issue. Um, Business owners want to uh, not only profit and not only grow their businesses, but they want to provide jobs and incomes to to families and, and workers that's sustainable. And, and that's always been a great thing about Oregon. There's always been a lot of jobs here throughout, uh, you know, throughout the history of the state, really. It's just grown and grown. Um, but there are some, some drawbacks there. What, what are your thoughts about business in Oregon? I, I'm with you 100%. I would love to see less regulation, less rules, providing businesses more of a more freedom to to run their businesses. I, I talked with a large uh, business out in White City last week and the OSHA regulations and the uh, basically the scrutiny from OSHA unjustly it really drives uh, uh, cost in his business. And he is a business that actually is very friendly to the environment. He is actually taking the, uh, the choice, his own choice, to ensure that his business is, uh, is a sustainable business, but he still gets super scrutiny from OSHA. And when those agents come and scrutinize, it hampers business and it slows down business. People need to recognize that it's not just the regulation, but it's the cost that's involved when you have to actually stop production for an inspection or 
cease production to adjust something for, for a regulation. And those have costs. It, 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 same with development. When you have to slow down development for regulations that cause longer wait times for planning or longer wait times for zoning because of specific zoning and planning requirements that are driven by the state, those add costs. The longer a developer takes to develop a piece of property, the more it costs for that property to be developed. And if folks are interested in affordable housing, a more streamlined, efficient system will make housing much more affordable. Absolutely. And, and uh, good developers look at where they're most likely to finish their deal. I'm, right. you know, they're not, we want them to shop here. I, will, I like developers. I think, uh, um, you know, things are going to, things are going to grow. There's going to be urban scrawl. It's happened throughout time, but uh, w it, when we chase developers away, that leaves less housing and we're in a housing crunch right now. And, you know, I have 20 something year old kids, two of them already own houses and one's, One's the youngest, and I, I want it to be affordable for them. And you don't do that by having uh, half million dollar homes and uh, no no inventory. I'm with you. I, uh, my son's 28 years old. He's trying to find his first home, and it's very difficult. One of the things, and I mentioned earlier, you know, I'm not the policymaker for the city as the mayor. However, I can do advocacy, and I can create ad hoc committees. I won't. They don't generally create policy, but they can drive some decisions and help to streamline things. And one of the first things I did when I when I became mayor was create an ad hoc committee on development. And we met with a panel of developers, about eight of them, uh, included architects, engineers, local developers, uh, some land use attorneys, and we discussed what would it take to make our process in the city of Medford more streamlined? And we also then met with the department heads and provided the issues that they were running into. And out of this, we came up with a better solution to make development faster, more streamlined in the city of Medford. And we'll actually be presenting those uh, final tweaks to, uh, to my committee next month. And so it's actually something that's gonna help things out. That being said, there are still clouds on the horizon from Salem because there are certain rules that are being created up in Salem right now that will add cost and increase time on planning and development in the future. But we can change that. We have the opportunity if we elect the right people to go up there and make a difference, we can change that. Absolutely. Uh -oh. I like that. I like that quite a bit. And somebody that's already been working in that inside the city of Medford, heading up to Salem to to project the same ideas and getting you know developers involved in the decisions and the people that will actually bring the American dream to towns in Oregon. Um, if you get them involved in the decisions, then there's less politics and confusion later, less yeah. money spent too. I agree. And one other issue is you know since you asked me about some of the issues that that are highest on my list, wildfires. Oh. Wildfire is a huge issue in Southern Oregon. And um, early on in this last legislative session, I was asked by a sponsor of Senate Bill 1573 to take a look at the bill. And we have in the legislative agenda for the city of Medford, wildfire reduction, smoke reduction as one of our, our concepts. So I read the bill and I actually thought it was a solid bill. It was for forced thinning in 10 counties in Southern Oregon. I've also read plenty of studies, and most recently OSU put out a great study on forest thinning and controlled burns, and if forest thinning alone can reduce the uh, magnitude and length of wildfires, and it can. And so I felt that this bill was, was very sound to go and thin the forest, reduce the fuels around Southern Oregon, and help to reduce the severity of our wildfires. Unfortunately, that bill never made it out of committee. Yeah. Um Awful lot of forest around us is reproduction temper, and when that canopy has, you know, fr from the thought of environmental concerns, when that canopy's already been damaged uh, 100 years ago, uh, and we can't play a role in making that different now, but an awful lot of saplings, an awful lot of brush, a lot, awful lot of things grow there that didn't grow there before, and that thinning is, is definitely a strategy that I hear from lots of people in 
not just in the timber industry, but forestry folks that that think, you know, control burns work too, but also have a huge potential of getting out of hand and causing problems. And you know, I, I lived, my house was a block and a half away from the Alameda fire and we lost a storage unit. We were, we were lucky, but all of our neighbors, they lost their homes and some of them are just starting to make it back now. Um, I understand why people are scared. And that first year after the, the big fires here, uh, people were terrified every time they saw a control burn. We can't work off of people's fear, but we can we can definitely use, use the science and reduce some of those fuels without uh, harming the environment under our own own actions. I agree with you. I have the uh, you know my voters camp pamphlet came in the mail, which is which is kind of fun. I like to dig through it, but <laughs> I, it just came in the mail, so I had an opportunity to to, to read your your campaign submission in the voters pamphlet. I see. Um, some county commissioners endorse you, uh, prior police chiefs. And then aside from the endorsements, uh, this one caught my eye. Randy has a lifelong record of helping to make this community safer and better. He's just what Southern Oregon needs in Salem. Congressman Greg Walden. That's a, that's a hard one to get. Um, usually when somebody's already, already sat in a, a big state office that, not a lot of endorsements come from there. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Yes, when I uh, when I announced, uh, quite a few people actually came out to support me, and were very excited about the fact that I decided to run for this particular position, including you know retired Congressman Walden and, and also uh, Senate Minority Leader Tim Canope. And so I, I feel very supportive on, from the from the. Uh, Politi politi politician end of things, right? But I also feel pretty supportive from the community as well. I mean, when I'm going out and I'm talking to people and and talking to business leaders, a lot of them recognize that my philosophies match their philosophies, and their Southern Oregon values, and they're the type of things that need to be heard in Salem. Absolutely. Um, I know if you make it there, I'll feel more represented. Uh, other things that you want? Well, well I guess I should back up here just a little bit I, I just read over your experience and, and we don't need to talk about your competitor but the experience list is is quite a bit different there i encourage people to look at their voters pamphlet how many years have you been serving the public 30 30 and, and you want to do more and i want to do more it started when i enlisted in the army national guard in 1989 and it hasn't ended uh -huh. i i Shortly after getting back from basic training, I started volunteering at the Medford Police Department, and I stayed there until I retired as chief, moving up the ranks progressively. And you know that, Ryan. We've yep. discussed this before. Uh, maybe some folks in the audience don't know my background, but uh, I never left the city of Medford, really. I, after retirement, I was asked to come back by the city manager to be his chief policy advisor, and I did that for seven months until he hired a new deputy city manager. And... Shortly thereafter, I ran for mayor and got elected, and I've been there ever since. I, I think you have an incredible foundation for this next office, and I appreciate, appreciate you coming down here to talk to me. Thank you very much, Ryan. Thanks for having me today. Take care. Thank you.